Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we assemble to explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our sixth season, we're looking at the Avengers. I'm Andy Nelson from the True Story FM Entertainment Podcast Network. I'm Pete, right, y'all, and I'm feeling way vulnerable today. Let's get real. <laughs> today, we're, we'll talk about it, Pete. We'll talk about it. Don't you worry. Today, we're talking about Minute 65, which begins with Agent Romanoff questioning Loki about Barton's mind and ends with Loki asking her what she'd do if he vowed to spare him. Back on the show, last time this season, sadly, it's Travis Bow. Hello, Travis. Hello there. I'm now sad. And I want to talk about my feelings. I know. Oh, heavy. Let's do it. Yeah, Everybody is... get in the dome. <laughs> <laughs> Got some bongos. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, you know, let's start there. This is the last chance you're going to have to talk about this particular film. Um, where does this film stand for you as far as stacking up with all the other Avengers films? Specifically, the Avengers movies, the four, or you Just mean the four the Avengers? Films. Okay, no, yeah, I mean there's a lot. If you want to try ranking all whatever thirty plus, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I do we'll have it here. ranked in my letterbox. <laughs> no, it, gosh, this movie is so watchable. You know, it's got so many moments, and it's that first time that that the the Avengers come together in that Battle of New York. You know, so just that moment alone keeps this movie i mean really like it's probably my number 2 right behind uh, end game end game is is easily in my top 5 favorite movies now i love end game so much but this you know avengers is right there um and then i don't know i really like i've come to appreciate age of ultron a lot more now that it's it's free from the shackles of being the sequel to the Avengers and all that hype. Sure. It's a good movie. It really, really, I think holds up and infinity war is great, but it's also like, eh, this is part one, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, Avengers <sighs> though is, is my number two, I think favorite MCU movie. It's always interesting to kind of, uh, to kind of look at that because there's so many different angles you could take with each of the films as to like, you know, what makes them stand up and stand higher than others, you know? And so I, I don't know. I just find, always find it interesting to, to think about in context of, of each other because I mean, it's an interesting franchise with so many different properties and they're all kind of tied together, but you also have you know, you have an Iron Man trilogy, you have uh, a Thor quadrilogy, you have the Captain America uh, trilogy, and uh, Ant-Man has several, Doctor Strange has a few. Like, you, you're starting to kind of get this sense of the characters not as just characters who all came together for these big team movies, but you're getting this sense of, you know, they all have their individual stories too. And so it's interesting, though, as these Avengers films, to look at them, like, how did those four kind of build? Uh, well, okay. Now that we've gotten that big picture talk out of the way, let's go. Let's go little because now we just got this intimate conversation going on between Loki and Natasha. We're continuing our conversation with them at this glass cage where Loki is being held. Natasha has snuck in. We talked about that in our last minute, and we're getting into this deeper moment here about her reasons for being here, and she's really setting up this ulterior reason that she's here. She snuck in. And really, it's because she is concerned about Agent Barton and wants to make sure that he is OK. And that's really kind of the way that she's setting this whole thing up, which plays into Loki's thinking of their relationship about love and all of this. So, well, let's talk about this. So following from our conversation in yesterday's minute, how does this continuation work? Do you find that it's evolving in a way that makes sense? I think the way that Loki says, you know, she he asks, is, that, is this love? That now, now like having watched it now a few times, kind of isolated like this, I get the sense that he is, he, he's playing the defense. He's kind of shook because he wasn't expecting any of this. And now he's trying to deflect. He doesn't want to give anything away. So he's going to, you know, flip it and put it back on her. Oh, do you just have a crush on this guy? And, you know, she obviously comes right back with love is for children. And then he starts to back away. Like just physically, he backs away while he's 
safe. He's protected, you know, but he's still, I think, because he's a little unsure, he's now backing away and he says, tell me. So, again, he's putting it on her to open up and reveal information, reveal your, you know, something I can use against you. So he's, I think, in a, in a very short amount of time, he's trying to get something over on her. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, this is this is a and the fact that she is sort of playing a game of match wits, right? Like she's sitting down. She's mm-hmm. they're both kind of putting themselves in positions of vulnerability to build trust and to actually see what they can learn by giving away just a little piece. Uh, and she ultimately wins. And that's great. That's great. But I, I like the I like the way they sort of dance around watching it one minute at a time. Like if you didn't have the context of anything else and just open on Tom Hiddleston asking her, is this love, Agent Barton, and then making his way back to the bench? It's damn creepy. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's an interesting um, approach for him to take. You know, I mean, there's this sense of uh counselor and confidant that he's kind of creating in himself as he as he says that right and 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 because i mean she says i owe him a debt she's she kind of is totally dismissive of the idea of love and it really boils down to this um, you know we've heard it in so many films but a life debt basically Mm. and and so she has she needs to make sure that clint is okay she wants to make sure he's okay because of those particular reasons and she and so he takes this approach of confidant and sits down. She sits down and he says, tell me like a counselor and she opens up. And I, it's interesting to see that he's using this approach. And I guess from his perspective, we're seeing that he thinks that his approach is working. Obviously, she's playing him, but it's interesting where she does lower her guards. She sits down and kind of opens up and talks about what she had done before S.H.I.E.L.D., and how Barton is the one who helped her. Yeah. It's all such a play, too, right? Like, it's all such a play. Like, she is, she obviously doesn't have any issues giving up the fact that she has a storied history and that she made a name for herself. That's not a big deal. It's only a big deal because Loki doesn't know it yet, right? Like, that's what gives the false sense of vulnerability that he feels like he's getting somewhere, where he's absolutely not. She does not care. It's effortless for her to talk about this. In a way where I think that she also rightly assumes that if Barton is under Loki's control, Loki already knows all of this. Mm -hmm. Like, I think she's walking into this situation just making that assumption that everything that Barton, that's in Barton's brain about her is now in Loki's brain. And so she she plays this in a way where she's kind of giving him this story, kind of this sad story about, I was, you know, I was, uh, you know, uh, I have a particular set of skills, you know, Liam Neeson is my uncle. Yeah. Spirit animal. (laughs) Sort of thing. And, um, and she was in a situation where Barton was going to kill her, but helped her made a different call and turned her. And, and I don't know. I just, I think that it's an interesting decision on her part to to play this letting him think it's just it's so it's it's such a line as a spy i guess that you have to walk because you never really know if you're what your enemy knows if they're buying into anything that you're saying and so like she's really going down this road hoping that all of this is going to work and hoping that her assumptions are all correct and um it's it's just a lot of trust that you have to put into the job in these sorts of situations. That's the gamble. That's the gamble of being a spy, Andy. I mean, you know, also the gamble of being a podcaster. <laughs> so we, we relate. Totally relate. You can't let people in. You know, yeah, you, can't, uh, you gotta present this is who you are. And Right. <laughs> I, I like the 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 line that she says that the you know, he made he made a different call. That feels like it's a callback to something. I know it's kind of a foreshadowing to you know the her and, and Hawkeye kind of their action beat together where, where she knocks him out. It feels like she has a call to make there and she chooses to save him. So I 
I like that it becomes a callback, but it also feels like something that happened earlier that we should be picking up on here. This is the perfect example of why this movie also does need to be a pop-up video, Mm. because this would be (laughs) where we'd have the comic call out, right? Or you'd have a bar show up and the asterisk and it would say, mm. you know, remember this when they were fighting and this was in such and such a scene. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. It doesn't exist. But, but you know, to me, this whole exchange of them and their, their storied war history, um, it, it just builds culture, the shared culture between them. And I... I like it. I appreciate it. I don't, it does, I think you're right. It has the vibe of a callback, even though it's not a callback and the vibe of a foreshadow, you, you know, it, and, I, and that is, I think it's more of its intention. But we also do have that quick scene on the screen from many minutes ago of them, you know, shooting arrows together, which is itself a, a foreshadow of them, you know, fighting together later in the movie. So it's a complex tapestry. Of all the relationships, theirs really is the one that is most um, painted through words and descriptions of what they've done together without uh, ever giving us any actual footage. And I actual suppose that history, speaks yeah. to the fact that they've never had a movie. Like, we didn't get anything with them. You know, it would have been probably in the backstory in Hawkeye movie had it been made in, right. you know, in this phase before we get to this film. But um, it's just... It's interesting because it is designed, these conversations are just very much world building, giving us this sense of greater things that have happened in the past and hints that allow us to, um, you know, paint these pictures in our heads without having to have made those those films. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I like the way that it plays. I think that it, uh, I think it works well. And I I do, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember because, uh, gosh, let's see, now my brain is forgetting. Black Widow takes place after... Civil War. After Civil War. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we really never get right anything more from them. No, no. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it, and for being the first time that, that Hawkeye and Black Widow are in a movie together, they feel like they have history. Cool. Oh, totally. Yes, that's a really that's a great observation. It never none of nothing about their relationship feels empty. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, you know, that's an interesting um, observation because we were just talking about that earlier with Coulson and how th- it really feels how there is this relationship between him and Thor, and you're getting the sense of Thor and Eric and Pepper and Coulson and uh, all the relationships that everyone's building with Coulson. That really speaks to the writing and how smartly put together the script is from a character perspective of making us sense these backstories with the characters without having to give us a much you know and that's that's a lot of work and that's hard to do as a writer and uh, director to kind of craft these scenes and also for the actors to kind of like feel like there is this relationship there that um, is just completely written with just a few lines yeah especially because We've seen them on that little iPad screen together, mm-hmm. but they've not shared a scene together yet, right? And they won't until their their fight. Yeah, the closest they've been together is when she is looking at his picture on the on the bridge. <laughs> Man, yeah, it's it, sorry, Jeremy. This is a rough, <laughs> yeah, a rough ensemble movie for yeah. you to be a part of. <laughs> I know because I don't think. I'm trying to think when he attacks because she gets thrown into the situation with Bruce. Yeah. So, yeah, I just I feel like there's really not an opportunity for the two of them to ever share the screen together until much later. What a shame. What a shame. But a shame. also comical. Shame. But that's also really interesting because creating this relationship of trust, of friendship, of loyalty with this character that is written as a bad guy from the start of the film, Mm -hmm. we are given so much to like about Clint without knowing anything about Clint. And that's actually a really interesting and probably challenging path that they chose to take by saying, we have to make this character likable, somebody who we believe is part of this team, even though he's not going to be a part of the team until much later in the film. How can we do that? 
I know, we'll have these moments of this backstory. And that gives us the sense that we as an audience can trust him, we like him, we believe that he is a valuable asset here. It's, I mean, it's an interesting approach to, and a challenging one to, for them to have taken. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the moment between Colson and Black Widow on the phone, when, she, when he gets through to her and says, Barton's been compromised, and that stops her in her tracks, you know, to, to her, that is, it, she sells it on her face, that her reaction to that, that's what lays the groundwork for us to to know that these two people care about each other. They have history. There's this love here, you know, regardless of her saying it's for children. There is a love here and a, and a respect here Yeah, that I think is established there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's done smartly. I mean, I, it's it, I, no... I it's it's written well. It's written well and it's crafty that they're able to accomplish so much with so little, never giving them screen time together. That's yeah. really smart. It's almost like they gathered good actors and made a good movie. Yes. It's <laughs> almost like that. Uh yeah, at the very end of this minute, um uh, Loki then throws out essentially kind of an offer to her and I again just it's again, it's an interesting scene because both of these people are essentially working to play the other. She's the one who ends up coming out on top. But the way that he's playing her is is through Clint. Like she has just kind of pitched him this story and you know, they're in this moment of vulnerability. He is seeing this as I've got it. I've I've pulled from her what I need and now I know how valuable Clint is to her. And so he throws out this offer to her, and what would you do if I vow to spare him? And it's an interesting line because it kind of sounds like my intentions were not to spare him at all. I've been planning on just kind of killing him. And so, which, I mean, we'll certainly get more of that in the in the coming minutes as we kind of wrap up the scene here. But it's it's interesting the way that he is, there's, there is, again, this shift going from counselor and confidant to... I. Uh, I, I can see that you uh, you value this person and and you know it's almost like now he's essentially trying to do some bargaining is the way that he's playing it. Mm -hmm. Is he maybe throwing out if you come over and be my puppet, I'll release him. You know, maybe making an, an offer like that, but probably not. Well, but it's interesting to think that. Had she been so like had she not been playing any of this, but legitimately been here in concern for Clint, if there was that angle that she was taking and he said, what will you do if I vowed to spare him? And she said, you know, what, I, I would trade positions with him in a heartbeat. It is interesting to think like what would how would that have shifted this conversation? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it would certainly be interesting. Well, we're going to find out uh, more about the conversation when we come back next time for Minute 66. Um, any last thoughts from either of you about anything? And Travis, this is your last chance to chat about the movie. So uh, any last thoughts about the movie? Um, well, specifically in this minute, there was, uh, I think when she sits down, there's a little musical sting. And we haven't talked really at all about the music this week. Um, there's not a ton of music. Not a ton of it, yeah. I mean, the score overall is amazing. Alan Silvestri's music. But there's a little, I guess it's maybe a, a Black Widow late motif. When she sits, there's like a, just enough of a musical score or a little hint, it's a couple notes. It's the same notes that will come back when she is taking control of the Chitauri chariot. It, it's that same little sting. Hmm. Um, just played softer here, um, but just look for it. You know, I guess it becomes her music, I guess. Yeah, it's the theme called Red Ledger. And so I think that's, there you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's really, I, I, I don't know if you could effectively call it also her theme, but I, right. considering that it would come back, then yeah, I would think so. But uh, um, no, I mean, uh, as far as the movie itself, I, I love this movie. It is like I said, it's so rewatchable, and I've been following along with your coverage of it. You know, I've listened to your latest episode today, and, and you guys have been having a, a great season with it so far. Really enjoying well, it. You. Can't wait to hear, you know, 
follow along, you know, moving forward. And yeah, just uh, thank you guys for doing this work and taking it seriously and but also having fun with it because you guys have a lot of fun. You know, it, it's <laughs> it's a fun show to listen to. So thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Travis. Oh, uh, we appreciate it. Sometimes maybe yeah. too much fun. Uh, but, you know, it's <laughs> Well, it's appreciated on this side of the <laughs> microphone right. or earbud. Right, right, right. Well, we are having a great time uh, talking about it. The, certainly the movie opens up all sorts of conversations and uh, angles of discussion. So we're having a great time and it's, uh, it's a good season. So thank you so much for being a part of it. Uh, we yeah. definitely appreciate you uh, being here. I just remembered I did have a, I had another note that I wanted to share. Yeah. Because I, I watching the this minute and the in the previous minute and seeing Loki and Black Widow together, I wondered where did they meet for the first time in comics? Hmm. Um, you know, she goes back to what Tales of Suspense, basically Iron Man, I think sixteen. Um, he goes back, of course, to Avengers number one. But I couldn't. I I, I pulled up both of their the two characters like viewing order. Uh, this this great site that I don't know if um, yeah basically I was able to compare and just scrolling through and seeing well he shows up obviously a lot in Thor and some Avengers she so shows up in Avengers and then is a is a big part of Daredevil for a long time but they don't really have a lot of crossover and I couldn't find any comic issue that the two of them would have appeared in together. Until Avengers 313 from January of 1990. Uh, it's part of the Acts of Vengeance storyline where Loki was manipulating all the villains to team up and fight against different heroes than they normally fight against. So it's, you know, instead of putting Red Skull against Captain America, you put Red Skull versus Spider Man or, you know, whoever. But yeah, Loki was in that issue and so was black widow but they didn't face off and then going forward to like uh thunderstrike 19 and 20 they both appear in i wasn't able to find that issue on marvel unlimited so i can't say if they actually face off so i don't yet know when these two characters meet for the first time you know they probably assume that the these two characters had so much history anyways that they probably never had an introduction because whoever's writing it probably thought well they've they've faced each other countless times we don't need to actually have them hi i'm black widow I, you know we've never met before i'm i'm loki you know sort of par for the course for how they treated her character in the movies too <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> but i just thought it was interesting like going all the way to to 1990 before they would appear in a comic together yeah that is interesting i i well i mean i feel like her character in the comics went through a lot of transformations oh, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. I think that that might have led to some of the reason why she may not have just been in the direct path of Loki stories, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just realized one last thing that I keep meaning to talk about and have yet to talk about, but this scene here of, of Natasha sneaking into Loki's cell to talk to him, this is officially, according to the wiki, the first thing that happens in the wee early hours of the morning on May 4th. So this is the start of the big day with the Battle of New York. So everything pretty much through uh, to the end of this, uh, most to the end of the film is all happening um, now officially on this day. So we are May 4th, 2012. Here we go. Here we go. And conveniently here in the uh, in our universe, the Avengers opens on that same day. <laughs> ah. All right. Well, Travis, um, it's been a lot of fun. Tell everybody again about uh, what you're up to and where they can find it. Sure. Uh, Real Comic Heroes is my comic book movie review podcast. And then Minute of Thieves is my Robin Hood Prince of Thieves by Minute podcast. And Pete and Andy, like I said, have, have been on the show already. As of this recording, they'll come back for, for more fun. So check that out. And uh, yeah, the the notes and links will be in the show notes for, for this episode. So check those out. Fantastic. Everything is in the show notes, as he said. And again, if you don't see those in your podcatcher, just go to our website, marvelmovieminute.com. You can learn more there. 
And you can also learn about our own membership where you can get uh, ad-free episodes, early episodes, bonus episodes, all that good stuff. That's it for today. We'll be back next time. Uh, So, Pete, thanks as always. Tomorrow, Andy, is Loki daddy? (laughs) (laughs) Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Message to the World by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yapo. Find the show at truestory.fm. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Hold up. 